the digital world, it, it scales differently. So you don't need to call one latchkey service at a time with AI, with being online, you can replicate things very, very quickly and it can be a one man shop or operation. So there's a huge difference in scale when we're looking at this online. If you believe we can change the narrative, if you believe we can change our communities, if you believe we can change the outcomes, then we can change the world. I'm Rob Richardson. Welcome to Disruption Now. Welcome to Disruption Now. I'm your host and moderator, Rob Richardson. Have you ever thought about how your data is used? Or better yet, have you ever thought about how data of your kids is being used? Do you have any idea about how much is happening behind the scenes? How that can be manipulated? How it's being manipulated? You know, I don't think we thought much about it. We entered, I'm gonna tell my age here, we entered this social media era and just everything was free. We were able to connect, it was all free. It was all great, but it's not free. Nothing's free in this world. That data is not free. You are the product. You are, and your kids are the product. The question is, are you comfortable with that? Does that matter to you? Well, we're here to actually to talk about why data privacy matters. It's just not, you know, it's just not people that are just liberals out here saying we need to protect our data. It's actually affecting all of us because whether you like it or not, you are a part of the digital economy. And that's just gonna amplify now with artificial intelligence. So with me to talk about how we can have a future that's actually uh, more about transparency and freedom and understanding how you can protect yourself is John Cavanaugh. He is the founder of the Plunk Foundation. And um, he's gonna tell you uh, a story in his journey because it's a very interesting one. But I want you to understand that you have the ability to protect yourself, to protect your kids, but you have to know where to start and we hope that by the end of this episode, you'll actually have that. But before we start, make sure you like, make, you, make sure you subscribe. That's how we're gonna keep the disruption growing. We appreciate you listening. And now I have the pleasure of introducing John Cavanaugh. John, how you doing, brother? Good, Rob. Thank you so much for the introduction. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. So you had an interesting journey to get to data, uh, to get to data privacy. I, I, I like to start, like this is such a, we met not, not, not so long ago. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was clear that you had a clear mission and focus. And I, I have to say, I, I consider myself pretty informed, but after I left our conversation, I became even more concerned about <laughs> data privacy. I was like, oh, this is worse than I thought. And uh, I'm just curious, how did you get into the world of data privacy? Like, how did this become your kind of central why? Yeah, so everybody in privacy, if you ask, they all have a wild story. Very few people just started out passionate about this. And like you mentioned in the introduction, we all thought the products we were using online were free and great. And yeah, there was some advertising behind it, no problem. We're used to that with television and stuff. But there's a, a dark side to it and people learn that at their own pace. Yeah. So a few people on my board, one was um, a lawyer uh, and he was just doing contract law and he saw a drone go over his house and he was with his kids and family. And it right. started that question like, you know, whose drone is that? Right. And why are they, do they have now video of me and my family? Right. So we all have those interesting ways. Um, for me, it started back in undergrad where I made a website. It was called Slate Up. And it was just a place as a pre-med student where I wanted to meet other students that were taking the MCAT already in med school because it's a huge decision. It's sure. like a half a million dollars in debt to figure out if you like being a doctor or not. Yeah. So. It was a lot of cost to figure that out. So I built a website to connect people, similar to like the old school version of Facebook. Yeah, and that was their mission, connect the world. Yeah, so I wanted to meet and connect with people, especially professionally and within school. And it grew very fast. Um, within the first three months, we had one fourth of UC uh, on wow. it. Yeah, and it grew in the Midwest, Ohio State, um, Middle Tennessee, uh, Clayton State University, lots of schools in Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana. And as we were growing, um, we got uh, research grants to keep it running, but eventually we needed a Series A funding. Sure. And we weren't, we weren't keeping any data of our users. We were like, oh, let's just um, make sure that we're taking care of them and that everything's protected, but we just wanna make sure that the people that are using our products um, feel good about you know the environment that they're in. Right. Again, our privacy policy is, hey, we're not selling anything, we're not pushing any ads. 
and we developed um, a way to make money by selling to universities. So we figured that would be our pipeline and our revenue to make money, um, which everybody agreed upon. But when we were looking at that Series A funding, every single investor, 50 plus that we talked to, every single one was saying, hey, what are you doing to sell the data? Because that's another revenue stream. Right. And you can't ignore it to be competitive in this day and age with tech. And I started learning about what that really meant. So right. when looking through the details of what data mining was, how it's used, who it's sold to, you enter this huge dark side of the internet right. that people are vaguely familiar with, yes. but when you really dive deep down about it, you understand how they're using various parameters about your life to nudge you to a decision. It can be a political decision. Right. It can be buying products at a certain time. It can be understanding your mental health state. Are you depressed? Are you sad? Well, you tend to buy more in this right. direction. Um, and we were primarily focused on college students who have, by default, pretty bad literacy, uh, financial literacy skills. Yes. So that was one thing was like, hey, a lot of these students are getting a lump sum that is debt, essentially, and spending it on beer and pizza right, on right. the weekends. But if we have an opportunity to slip our products in there as well, uh, where they're paying 12% interest on whatever t-shirt company right. they are, um, then that's good for business. But in the long run, it's not sustainable for our society. And I found a lot of objections. So uh, me and the core group, we decided to close down the organization and build a nonprofit. So you you mentioned me as the founder, but there are- and I wanna say that, just back, 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 back yeah. up for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. People just have to, I wanna make sure they absorb what you just said. <clears throat> a Series A funding is a big funding round. Yes. Right there is C's, pre-C's, Series A, you're talking minimum five million probably dollars. I don't know what it was then, but I'm guessing it's around that. Yeah. Like, so, be very clear, like millions of dollars was offered. Yes. And because you weren't comfortable with the direction of where the investors wanted you to go with the data, mm -hmm. you turned it down. Yeah. And, that, that's, and you started a nonprofit. Just make sure people understand that. So like, it's one thing to say that you have these principles. It's another thing to actually have done it, which I have massive respect for, right? Thank you. It could have been easy, by the way. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, it's, um, so I wanna talk about, uh, I want you to go down the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. But I, I like to just deep dive into like what really kind of uh, sparked you to say no to that. Because it sounds like you weren't against the idea of ads in general. It sounds like there was something, there was there are other things that, that deeply disturbed you to make you go from, it's one extreme to say, no, I don't want to do this to starting a nonprofit. Like, like what were like the, the top things that really just like stuck out? There has to be some things that like, that the investors or people wanted you to do that you just didn't sit right with you. Like, what, what were those things? Yeah, so our primary focus was understanding how students could feel at home at a university. Yes. And we were helping with uh, reducing melt rate where people said, hey, I wanna go to University of Cincinnati, for example, but then they wouldn't, at the end of the, like beginning of the school year, they wouldn't come because they went to Ohio State or something, right. as an example. Um, a lot of that is because they just didn't feel a sense of community. So we were helping facilitate that sense where the resident advisors, the people that live on the dorms, um, and the orientation leaders would connect in a better facilitated way. Right. Um, so people felt more at home. Um, and then, you know, to be honest, I was against ads because the business okay. model. No, no problem. Yeah, the business model that we had right. didn't need it. Right. So. Everything else was like, hey, these are slightly, it was a, a steep, like a curve of more and more invasive maneuvers, right. which was against the philosophy. It's like, hey, we have a good revenue stream. Um, universities are willing to pay for this. We had letters of intent and right. to buy and everything. So we were good to go. And um, they wanted you to be, I, I feel where you're going is that, uh, yes, you didn't like the ads, but I also think it was the level of what you would have had to compromise, it feels like, for becoming or for selling that would have meant that you would have gone away from your mission, it feels like. Exactly, and here's another thing, is I'm convinced in the tech world, if you are a for-profit tech company, unless you're a billionaire and you can fund everything itself, at one point you're gonna be cash strapped. So if it's not the series A that we compromise on, it's gonna be a series B, 100, right. 100 million or something like that. And what's gonna happen is companies, they want, or investment firms, they want somebody on the board that makes decisions. 
And unless you are a super galactic unicorn like Zuckerberg, who has all of the voting rights. But even, but, but, but he had to still do that. And I, I, I don't think he has any problem with it, actually. You know? Yeah. So like, I don't even say is he, he doesn't share your, your moral dilemma on this. I just think we got to be honest, right? But, but yeah. he's like, he did share that, but you're right. Even, but like, but also he's following the model that they want. Yeah. That, yeah. And, he, and, you know, he does it to some. Like, uh, builders have a tough job. But I don't. But I do think that they don't do enough for policy to protect people. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is, you, you if you would have done that, you would have had no ability to protect the people that you're fighting for. Yes, and it can only get worse. Yeah. And um, I totally respect that. Like to be now do that. I mean, for this is why this is amazing. This is why I was moved to have you on. So sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead. You're good. You're good. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. But to um, if I died tomorrow, let's say I'm running it, and yeah. I I have decision. Like even best case scenario, I have full decision. I die tomorrow, whoever's taking my place, there's nothing, uh, there's no law protecting the original mission that we have. Somebody can come in and say, this is our business strategy. Um, whereas a nonprofit has an articles of incorporation that the government enforces. Right. So if our founding team, um, by the way, our founding team's amazing, there's four of us. Uh, if our founding team all dies tomorrow, whoever upholds it is legally bound to right. uphold our constitution. And to change that is extremely difficult. Uh, and the people that have to change it have to look at our, our mission and see if that follows our mission. So um, that's why I made the shift to, if we're doing something in, in the tech space, it needs to be a nonprofit. Okay, that's amazing. So <clears throat> you started the Plunk Foundation. Mm -hmm. Now tell us, you moved from you know working to help the community of college students. What is the Plunk Foundation doing now? What is its mission? Yeah, so um, the mission is to wake up as many people in the same way that I was woken up right. when uh, <clears throat> when I did this deep dive. It was like pulling the matrix out and like, right. oh, this is really what's going on. Um, and it's to do it in a way to create awareness. So the four, four main principles that we're doing is creating awareness. We wanna build education off of that. Um, we want to create technology that solves for it. So it's great to say, hey, guess what? You're screwed, Rob, but I don't right. have any solutions right. for you. Right. Okay, that doesn't help anybody. Yeah. If we have tools and technology, so technology and tools are the second piece, uh, second half. So awareness, education, technology, and tools. Okay. To give people the steps that they need to protect their privacy. Okay. The second part of that is that we are also not only focused on privacy, but we're focused on digital safety. Okay. And that's more encompassing. So similar to when we were kids, our parents would say, don't talk to strangers or look both ways before you cross the street. What does that mean in an ever-changing online landscape? What does it mean when it comes to virtual reality, when mm -hmm. it comes to AI, when it comes to just using our phones or our laptops? And how do we inform our children? How do we inform families? And um, keep that as a thread that we are on the pulse for whatever advancing technologies come. Yeah, give some examples. Like, so people think digital safety, uh, and you gave me some really great examples, but like, mm -hmm. People don't. People probably don't appreciate what that means. Tell me, why should people care about digital safety? Yeah, I think people have some idea of privacy, mm -hmm. and that feels easier because it's like, all right, you can, you can, you, you get to choose what level you want to do. Do you want to have your information shared? Do you not? And that mm -hmm. needs to be in a, an informed, consent way where we actually understand what you're telling us. Yes. Not not a ten thousand page terms mm -hmm. and conditions. It's we can sell your information. It can be sold to anybody. Are you comfortable with that? Or yeah. you not? Yeah. And the people need to really have that versus whatever we have now. It's like not informed consent. Yeah. I, I, I believe that's pretty, I think overall people understand the what privacy means and why that's important. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by digital safety? Yeah, so digital safety has a lot of um, general threads. So it can be a mix of cybersecurity, such as when you are creating a password, are you creating a long password, a short password? Um, do you have uh, authentication, multi-factor authentication, so that if somebody finds your password, you get sent something on your phone saying, did you approve of this password being sent? There are little things, like very basic things. Are you updating your devices regularly? Um, there are things such as, what are the next scams that are happening on TikTok or Facebook? Um, we now know with AI, there have been phone calls that are replicating somebody's voice. Yep because all you need is a six second sample. So those types of things that I need to understand, um, that if I'm a mom and my kid calls me from a phone and it sounds like them, but it's not registered, I don't know it's their actual phone number, and they're saying, hey mom, I need money. Right. 
for you to have some street smarts. Yeah. Some digital street smarts. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah, exactly. That's a good, that's a really good, that's a really good example. Like I remember growing up, uh, my parents and I had a, um, had, had a password between the family mm -hmm. that only three or four people knew if that was, so you would know actually if, 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 if somebody said they, that they were trying to pick you up because this is going to age me again, but we were latchkey kids. Right. So like sometimes we were, which is never happens now. Like you get picked up by people, aunts and uncles. Um, and we would only know that if people would know a password, mm. hardly anybody ever picked me up by the way, but <laughs> it usually just went home myself, but they, t but they would tell us that because kids were getting kidnapped Right when people were uh, saying, "Oh, your your father," I'm a friend with your father, right? And he told me to take you home. Yeah, and like so, kids sometimes wouldn't know the difference. You know the father's name. They say, "You know this." Uh, I know this about your family. So mm -hmm. you assume because kids are more trusting because having right. been through the level of uh, exposure and experience that adults have. So we had we had like passwords that we all have to know, and it's funny. Like I feel like that needs to come back now. Like people, people didn't, people don't think about that as much now. But it's it's because people don't get strangers don't pick up their kids. Most of the time we have helicopter people now, <laughs> moms and dads. Like yeah. everything is like encapsulated. But it's not really with di with the digital world, is it? It's not, and the digital world it, it scales differently. So you don't need to call one latchkey service at a time with AI, with being online, you can replicate things very, very quickly and it can be a one man shop or operation. So there's a huge difference in scale when we're looking at this online. Yeah, I also remember an example that we that we talked when we first met yeah. about how digital safety affects the most vulnerable of populations. Mm -hmm. Like I'd love for you to, to talk through that example. We talked about like um, women that are, for example, like women that are recovering from uh, uh, violent acts and domestic abuse, yeah. like that go to organizations like Women Helping Women. Mm -hmm. You know, you really talked about how digital safety can affect uh, people like that that I never thought about. Talk about like why even uh, even the most uh, vulnerable populations could actually be uh, more at risk as well. Yeah. So what we're seeing a lot now in the landscape through our research is that there's various areas. There's human trafficking, there's intimate partner violence and domestic abuse um, that we're seeing a lot of these things happening. And then there's school bullying and sextortion. So um, let's go to, your, to the first example, is that um, in women's shelters, uh, there's research that's been done in Europe that found that 79% of women who went to a shelter for domestic abuse were tracked in some way or form oh, online. Wow. wow. There is, but the national network to end domestic violence, which is here in um, in the U.S., yeah. they found that it was a hundred percent of people. Damn. And now they surveyed uh, probably like a couple thousand less, um, right. but either way, the the survey was over three thousand people. So it is a significant amount of people who are saying that online um, I'm being oh. tracked, and this could be if my Snapchat location is on. For those that use Snapchat, it could be my car uh, is uh, being tracked. It could be my phone. It could be more um, like the Apple AirTags, which are very common to slip into a car. I just talked to a young woman who had that happen to her. She has no idea who it was from. So there are various ways of tracking and stalking that's that's done. So how, how does Snapchat tra track? Tra you can turn your location on. They have an... Um, they have a piece that's called Snapchat Maps. Right. And you can turn your location on, you can see where people are at, at all times. Yeah. And it's pretty common for, for youth to have that on. Um, some are very selective about which friends have it, but some partners may demand that you have these types of things on. And if you don't, you will get in trouble, as an example. And, and what type of tools do they have in place? Like you should, like they should, like Snapchat should probably do a lot more to warn, to warn kids or maybe turn that on and off to say, do you, because I know like, uh, Apple at least started doing that. Like, do you want this to stay on? Do you want to stay on? Mm -hmm. But I think with kids, there probably needs to be another level of uh, protection and safety. Absolutely. And kids are using it all the time to figure out like who's at what party or where they're yep. going with things too. That's, that's tough. Like, um, so how do you balance this when you think about like, how do we balance the, obviously the innovation and, 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 and having the right balance between what, what I guess policy or regulation needs to look like uh, obviously you and I are both believers in policy and regulation. Mm -hmm. Some will hear that and say like, you create regulation, it's gonna kill innovation, Yeah, right? That's the line. What's your response to that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, the way that I think about it is that most organizations that are, that are doing this um, 
have good intentions. Um, they're trying to make good products. And I don't blame them at all. The, the areas that I'm really looking toward um, is when it comes to bad actors. So when it comes to corporate policy and privacy, there is this culture of surveillance capitalism. Yes. The, the, Pl the Plunk Foundation doesn't focus on that, although it, we're aware that happens. We're more focused on how we can help with bad actors, but uh, help fight against bad actors, sorry. Um, and, but when we look at the, the corporate area, the way that I see it, and this is a, the more personal take, but the way that I see it is that they have been using a technology before regulation. So everything before regulation is sort of a gravy train yep. for them, but there are, but then the consequences that they have will not allow for what they're doing to be sustainable in the long run. Right. If they're, if they're taking everything and bastardizing it and sucking it in as, and turning it out as AI, you're gonna have a lot of problems of quality data that exists. Yep. You're gonna have a lot of problems of um, taking and, and um, just having massive amounts of siloed data that when cyber attacks happen, now you have data you shouldn't have collected to begin with or you should have purged, and now it's affecting a, as a national security risk. Mm. So um, the Biden administration actually released um, about around October a, a bill for cybersecurity where they're funding um, for people to get jobs in cybersecurity. And this does tie into privacy and digital safety, but they want to, because all of the top businesses are not equipped for example, what China has when, when it comes to their um, ability uh, to hack, as an example, when it comes to missile launching, when it comes to, let's say if PNG shuts down, you know, because of cyber, cyber um, attacks or something along those lines, or a coordinated effort that shuts down multitudes of hospitals. So we're looking at this from a national security and defense uh, type of thing. And businesses in the United States have a lot of freedom compared to a lot of other countries to navigate, but we need some type of unity of how are we protecting our citizens which in turn protects the country. So it is a national security risk um, no, by the Biden administration. No, that's, that's very, very interesting. It's a <clears throat> national security risk. And so you had to answer one of my questions, like how do you see navigating this if you were, uh, I guess, president and ruler for a day where you had the control of Congress and your president and Senate, what laws would you pass to, 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 to help us with both privacy and digital safety? Yeah, so I think mimicking the GDPR is probably the best place to start. In America- Tell people what the GDPR is. Yes, yeah, so that's the um, the European Union's uh, privacy law. And it's um, basically, it's global. So it's like, imagine it'd be a federal law here. And um, it controls um, what amount of data a company can collect, the limits, and um, it's very complicated and, right. and very thorough. Um, but the main thing is that your privacy is a fundamental right. And to have access as a company or as an organization to the privacy, the person needs very clear consent saying yes. Exactly. And they can revoke that at any time and they say, hey, never mind, I don't want you to have my data. The only exceptions, there's a few exceptions and I'm not an expert on GDPR, but there are a few exceptions that, that when it comes to like a court case, as an example. Yeah. So fairly reasonable exceptions. Right. Um, and. But the most important philosophical thing in the difference is that in the United States, privacy is an asset that you trade for services. Mm, mm, that's good, yeah. In Europe. Well, that's bad, but it's a good yes. line. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> it's a bar. But yeah, it's, it's a bar, good. it's a bar, but like it's, not, it's bad, yes. <laughs> Say that again one more time, because okay. I think that's important. Just, just drop the bar again. Okay, so in the United States, privacy is an asset that you trade for services, convenience, whatever that is. Mm. In Europe, it's a fundamental human right. And the United Nations, actually, they have a uh, bill of fundamental human rights. Article 12 is about privacy as being a fundamental human right. And to be frank, in the developing world, the US is very behind on this. Yes. Um, and we have patchwork laws. So like California has CCPA, which is the California Privacy Act. And it's emulated from European Union's GDPR. Right. So. They're, they're using that, but that's only in California, right? And Colorado has a few things. Virginia has a few things. Um, Kentucky is passing a bill, and it's, it's like a slap on the wrist for organizations that violate it, but it's a start. Right. So there are various patch, we call it a patchwork framework, right. um, but there's nothing federal that's, that's happening, and that's something that would be ideally the best place to start.
No, oh, no, that's that's uh, very well said. So, all right, the average we don't have policy now. It's mm-hmm. obviously in the U.S. It's the wild, wild west. Privacy is an asset. It's not a right in the, in the U.S. Unfortunately, uh, what are some steps people can take? Like, what are some practical steps? You talked about a few. You talked about having multiple uh, forms of authentication. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some things that you think? What are some basic things people can do, and, or places they can go to learn about? steps they can take to protect themselves? Yeah, so I think that when it comes to individuals, um, just being aware is half the battle. Yeah. Because when you're aware of what's actually happening, there are a few resources. The Plunk Foundation's website, it's plunkfoundation.org, P-L-U-N-K. Yes. By the way, it's an acronym for peaceful, loving, uplifting, nurturing, and kind. So that's why Plunk. There you go. Um, so plunkfoundation.org has resources on yeah. this. There are other things such as the Center for Humane Technology, the Mozilla Foundation, um, DuckDuckGo has a blog. It's like a Google search engine that's that's privacy centric. Um, there are there's the International Association for Privacy Professionals (IAPP). Those are all really good resources. The EFF has a really really good write ups on such things such as like police surveillance and how that's being used and um, things you can do about. It. And they also have a ton of lawyers on their team that actually go to battle and court and try to win cases when it comes to privacy. Those are all really good things. In terms of practical, actionable steps, um, we are building a curriculum at Plunk to do this and to put it online and make it available. But extremely basic, I'll give a few, like right off the bat. Uh, Extremely basic. Um, One is make sure your devices are updated. Um, If you, even if you have good privacy in place, if the device isn't updated, it's easy to get into. So make sure you update your device, yep. hands down. That's that's the best thing. Two is that you wanna make sure that you have at least a junk email address where you can, if you if you go to a store and they ask for your email address for 20% off, 30% off, whatever that is, typically I would say don't do it, but if you wanna make it easy, just have a junk email address uh, with information that's not relevant to you. Um, it doesn't have your address, stuff like that. That's a good way to go about it. And here's a really interesting one that um, if you go to the doctor and they, or if you go pretty much anywhere and they want to scan your ID, they don't need to scan your ID. They can verify that it's you and you can say, hey, I would like for you, you can verify this is me, but you don't need to scan it. Right. Because a lot of companies take that, they scan it, and now they have a ton of information about you that they don't need and they store it or they resell it or share it with other third party members. and you don't need to do that. So if you have a kid or anything along those lines too, don't need to do any of that scanning. Um, You don't need to give your social for a lot of places. So it's always good when somebody says, may I have your social? You can ask, is that required for us to continue this transaction? Right. Um, Even at a doctor's office, it's it's often not. So they don't need any of that information. So doctors resell your stuff too? So- I hope not. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know. This isn't gonna be a clickbait moment, but there's, uh, there's a law called, or there's an act called HIPAA, which is oh, the yeah, Health yeah, and Information yeah, yeah, Privacy. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so they can't do that. So what happens is there's a barrier that you have to meet, you, you have to be um, some type of person that, or entity that crosses this, this barrier of right. health information. Once you do, which means you meet a lot of the, the federal regulations, you sure. have to meet all these federal regulations. Once you do, you have the ability to transact with people who, uh, yeah. who have, reach that barrier. Right. Yeah, but so, so you can share or they can share information. Right. And some of that is like the part of me that is conflicted on that. Mm-hmm. The part that's not conflicted is I understand even when things are used for good purpose, people find ways to use them for nefarious purposes. Yeah. I, I get it. The other part of that though, is, of course, the, the sharing of information helps to prevent uh, diseases, helps you learn about causes. So, I mean, Figuring out that balance of what that is, because I, I do think that's important, and I don't have the answers, is important. I mean, I, I so I do think there has to be like, because the sharing of that data, the problem is people don't trust that you'll do something like, what shouldn't be shared is if somebody has a, uh, a condition, that shouldn't be shared with the insurance company to figure out ways to, right. uh, so they can maybe not, well, they're not supposed to be able to not give you insurance, but we all know they can find ways to make it difficult for things not to be covered still. Um, yes, uh, that's the worry I have, but I'm like, I also know share the sharing of the information for things like 
understanding health patterns, you introduce things like doppelgangers that have people have similar profiles to you. Like, what do you think is the balance there in terms of figuring out how we share data? But it's not, it's probably regulation. I probably know the answer to my question on that, but. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually a pretty simple solution. Okay. And, and Facebook can do this with advertising. Lots of organizations can do this. It's just that don't attach personally identifiable information there you go. Yeah. to it. Anonymize the data, right? Like, hey, we have, you know, maybe there's 7,000 cases in Cincinnati of this thing. We don't need to be able to trace it back to who that, those people are. It's anonymized data. And um, I know for the nerds out there, they're gonna say, well, AI has the ability to de-anonymize data right. through that. There are techniques that brilliant people, even in the university- Zero proof knowledge, can, yes. Yes, and the, well, they add noise, so yep. you can't identify exactly who has what condition. And yep. so there are brilliant people coming up with these solutions. And to go to your question about um, how do we have uh, innovation you know, and privacy, there's so much innovation happening yeah. in this realm that protects us too. And there's so much innovation that's going on. I, I think to answer my own question out loud, I think we do have policy and we start incentivizing investment the same way we started doing uh, sustainability. Right. right. So now you're seeing all of this happening. All this happened all across Ohio, but really all across the country, uh, that there, there's just solar power farms being built everywhere. Of mm -hmm. course, there are people that are trying to be against it because they want to keep the money train the same way it's always been. I'm yeah. sure there will be people that want to keep data the way it's the way it's always been because that's how they've always made their money. Yeah. But to the point is, there's lots of op there's lots of jobs being created that way. Mm -hmm. Lots of opportunities being created that way. Yeah. And we start having a renaissance towards okay, we can protect people's privacy still innovate and we want to incentivize that type of activity that to me is one of the main purposes of policy yeah. policy is actually it is a guiding principle to say this is the type of society we want to be and we never get it perfect and we can't overdo it but i like the concept of how do we incentivize people to innovate and protect privacy we have the you, you talked about what you do in terms of uh the the solution to scrub out the noise using ai i mean there's also blockchains involved in this zero proof knowledge you're able to uh, hold data, like collect data mm -hmm. that's 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 totally private, but then you can still know about the data without knowing the data. Like I know it sounds weird, but it's the same type of thing you're talking about. Like it's a way of proving things without knowing the details of a person, which I think uh, we have the technology to do this. It's just what problem are we trying to solve in society? And right now we've just said nothing's more important than just how fast we can just uh, make profits without any type of uh, thought about should we do all of these things and how should we do them? Yeah, totally. And one thing, you know that this is an issue that is sort of bipartisan yep. because you will talk to um, a ton of different people from both sides of the aisle and you know it's something that needs regulation when people on the right are saying, hey, I don't even believe in regulation, but this, I, I know what, I'm in too deep. I know that there's something yeah. that- They know their kids are vulnerable. Yes, and another thing too is that a lot of things that we're seeing is that you could be an affluent family, but this could still happen to your kid. All Absolutely. It, all it takes is just one moment where, hey mom, hey dad, I hate you, you don't understand me, and then they put this online. Our, I used to talk crap about my parents <laughs> under a tree house. Right, but, right. <laughs> but the digital tree house exists yeah. where you're spewing that. And it just takes somebody who can identify through sentiment analysis, through using AI, um, and pinpointing exact locations of who may be having fits with their parents at this moment um, to understand, okay, these are vulnerable children. Yeah. And it just takes one connection. You can buy their data for five bucks to understand what their interests are. You can say, okay, it just takes this one connection with this child who's having a bad moment with their parents online. And that's all it takes to start something like that. So people are understanding like both sides of the aisle all sides of the income economic ladder are people that are affected from this. What happens if we don't get this right? Well, I think it's gonna get sort of like climate change. It's gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. Um, and, but I, I do see hope. Um, so it's hard to predict um, how AI um, will make this worse. It's hard to predict um, how bad actors, because they're very smart. I'm asking you to predict. What do you think that looks like if we don't get it right? I think it's gonna be a lot more like Brave New World. Have you seen Brave New World? Yes. Or, or I mean, um, I read the book. It, it's essentially where people kind of understand that this is happening, but they don't care that much. 
and there will be large corporations or large governments that are using that to understand everything about you and nudging how you think and what you think over time. Yeah. Um, there will be bad actors who are exploiting this to get their way with whatever they want. Um, and this could be not even just from a kids and you know vulnerable population perspective, but from policy. Absolutely. Um, so it looks very bleak, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. So yeah, that it's a world where the algorithms know us better than we know ourselves, and we don't even know that that's happening, like you said. Mm -hmm. And I and to take it further, like we can get to the point where and this sounds really freaky, right? that algorithms own most of people and corporations and nations. Now, that sounds weird, until you realize that most holders of land aren't people, they're organizations. So imagine if, we, if we're okay with algorithms, because this is very possible, that algorithms can eventually determine uh, who owns land, how policy is written, all those things that we don't even know. Like, I know it sounds like science fiction, but it's not science fiction when you understand that if there's not a, we don't have a guiding map for what we want in society, how we're using artificial intelligence to augment us, right? It's yeah. Augmented intelligence, not mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And AI, everybody, is not new. This is, this, is, this is algorithms and machine learning, all that has been going on for a long time. Yeah. Now we have another level of generative AI. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm with you. I think there's a lot of hope and potential but there's there's huge reasons to be concerned. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to understate how important it is, but it always sounds like tinfoil hat in a way. Yeah. So it's and it's impossible to predict because this is the thing I struggle with. We are generating so many billions of data points just like per second with AI and how that transforms without much regulation could go any direction and it's hard to predict just how bad that could be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we don't look out for this at all, we don't know how fast it can affect us. It'll go faster than we can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be exponential. It already is, it already is, right? Like we're growing, but that's hard for people to understand. Yeah. As you know, exponential growth is not something the human brain can actually uh, understand. Mm -hmm. So when people say exponential growth, you look like, what does that mean? That, it literally means it's growing so fast you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> right from the you like we understand as as nerds what exponential growth looks like. We can see it on a chart. Yeah. But we really can't visualize exponential growth. So it's moving so fast that like we need to this is why, you know, we, we, you're, you're going to be at Midwest Con and this is why like we're really focused on what does policy innovation look like? Mm -hmm. Like cuz we think I think you agree too that we don't policy mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we don't have innovation. It means that we are building trust so we can uh, build better innovation have a flexible enough policy, but a policy that sets clear rules so we understand how we're operating with one another. Like, I just think it's very important. Agreed. Like, we didn't even, we didn't even get to deep fakes and all those things yeah. that are really, like, like, that are really concerning to people. So, like, before we leave, mm -hmm. I got a couple of lightning round questions yeah. before I do this. Like, if you had to say something that would surprise people the most about the lack of privacy or digital safety, can you think of a story or an example that exemplifies that? Um, what would my, my surprise yes, people the most? Yes, uh, on average, you have 3,192 data points about you. And this is much better than people that are close to your friends may know about you. So these, this is being sold and um, traded every single day and being aggregated for every time you accept a term and condition, basically, right. that, that invades your privacy. And I remember the one thing that you told me about uh, when you sent out a picture of metadata. Please mm -hmm. tell people that. The which part? When you send out a picture and the metadata behind it, what that could, what you can just by sending oh, yeah. out one picture could do. Yeah, true. If you're uploading to Instagram or Facebook or uh, various sites, um, you can right click on a computer and inspect the element, and it shows what time of day this was taken, what camera it was taken from, uh, GPS coordinates. All of that stuff is not obfuscated um, for a lot of websites, so you're able to track people based on where they took a picture. Yeah. So. Very scary stuff, so just think about this. All right, so I wanna to get to a couple of lightning round, uh, lightning round questions about you. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have a committee of three, living or dead, to advise you on business, life, digital privacy, safety, whatever you want. Tell me who these three people are and why. Um, Marley Marlin Spike would be the first one who created the end-to-end -end encryption that's used on WhatsApp and Signal. So that would uh, be one. My grandpa, who was a judge here in Cincinnati, 
fantastic yeah. um, and really level-headed person. What was the, what's his name? Marley Marlin Spike? No, no, you're, you're my your grandpa. grandpa yeah. uh, Norman Murdoch. Okay. Yeah, right. he was county commissioner and judge for a while. Wow. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the third one, uh, I would probably, man, so many good people. I would probably look toward um, somebody named Steve Shahan, uh, who is a very interesting musician. Yeah, but he went to every pretty much every single country and learned about cultures and it would be just so good to get that perspective um, because he's still alive now and has seen how cultures have evolved and he's extremely intellectual in that way and I think you're going to need that perspective but I think those are the three that I would go for all right uh, what's an important truth you have that very few people agree with you on like a hot take yeah um, I don't like the otter AI <laughs> that is in every meeting. And I'm going to write something about this. I'm guilty. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's why I, I put that. Uh, yeah. But um, I get emails about it all the time. Every meeting I show up to. And then there are people that don't show up to the meeting that have it. And then I'm not in charge of the meeting. And now I see like all these things so capturing guess, uh, my voice. <laughs> Otter AI is not going to be a Plunk Foundation meeting. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I was uh, talking to John Salisbury about um, yeah. even just like when we have a meeting or a presentation, um, making people turn off their phones. Like if it's in person, yeah. like demanding people turn off their phones and just like creating attention. I also think Otter on one hand excuses people from really paying attention because they think they can go back to something. Whereas like, I want to, like, if we're having a meeting, I want full focus. I want good participation and I don't, and you know, this is a fleeting moment. So you got to pay attention. So I, I like that a lot. No, I think that's really important. And I'm guilty of what you just said. Right. <laughs> and, but I, but I respect it and I know it's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause, uh, in, in the last interview I had right before you, we, we were talking about the need to make sure people don't think that artificial intelligence is not going to replace intelligence. You need to still be intelligent. Mm -hmm. You need to understand how to do this and have focus, right? Because those who, who are able to uh, communicate their authentic intelligence, they will be the winners in art in the age of artificial intelligence, totally. right? Yeah. That, that takes though focus mm -hmm. that takes presence. Yeah. That takes still grinding it out and learning those hard parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and no amount of artificial intelligence will replace the need for authenticity. Totally. Period. Like, so I, I, I completely agree with you on that. All right. So, um, a time you failed in your life and how that made, made you better. I fail literally every single day, every single day. Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's always made me better. I think, um, there was one point where, um, back when I was first starting the slate up, uh, yeah. related stuff, um, uh, where I wanted to quit and I talked to my team about it and they gave me a week. Um, and uh, then I saw how much work my team was doing and I wasn't there to lead them. And I felt really bad about, you know, uh, wavering yeah. at that moment. Um, and I realized that leaders need extreme control on their emotions and they need to step up and not be that person that wavers. So it was either that I should not be a leader or I need to step up in that yeah. context. And that was a good path for me to like really understand. No, that, that's a great point. I'll say this from one leader to another because I've felt it too. You also need a safe a safe place to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and tell it because you're going to have doubts. You're going to have um, difficult times. Now that mentor may not be your team maybe. maybe. Mm -hmm. At some point maybe it can be, but yeah. having people that have been through it Cause it's always hard. Yeah. Like it, it always, it's always hard. Like even, even when you get to where you, where you think you want to be, then new problems come about. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, it, and there's, it's very hard for people to relate. It is to what you're doing. Like your family can't, they relate. can't. That's why you need to talk to other leaders. That's yes. what I'm trying to tell you. You, totally. need, you need to get support and advice mm -hmm. from people and pour in, and have them pour into you mm -hmm. and you'll help them too, because you're, you're going to be, you need to be vulnerable because if you feel like you always have to take it on, yeah, you might break too, which also hurts your team. True. But I agree with you in terms of regulating your emotion. It, I've, I've had to learn that too. Mm -hmm. And I'm still learning that. It's a constant process yeah. of one regulating their emotions, but you have to be in a place where you can also be vulnerable. Uh, and sometimes you have to show your team vulnerability too. Like mm -hmm. all of this stuff is balanced. And I think your team showed you 
that they had your back. And that sounds like that inspired you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Final, final, final lightning round question. What's your slogan? Your, your, that it'll be on your, that'll be on your grave. What is it? Um, probably something like we're all going to die. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, don't take it too seriously. All right, brother. Good to see you, John. Good to see you too. Thank Pleasure you. having you on.